Good evening. For those who don't know you, my name is Sister Kathy Duffy. I'm the president of the American Tayard Association, as well as director of the Institute for Religion and Science at Chestnut Hill College. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this evening's program, both those of you who are in person and those who are watching on Zoom. A particularly warm welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. I know we have several here in the audience. The Institute for Religion and Science, a regional center exploring science and spirituality, was established 10 years ago to promote the constructive engagement of religion, spirituality, with science and technology, and to encourage a dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science, and civil. To this end, we sponsor lectures, reading circles, conferences, and other programs. So check our website, and you were seeing uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, URL up on the, the stage, I hope, or the uh, slides, I hope you got a chance to write it down. So check our website for events, resources, and particularly the videos from past events. And uh, sign up for the Institute's mailing list if you are interested. Uh, the American Tayard Association was established in 1967, so it's much older, to extend knowledge of the cosmic vision of Tayard de Chardin, to encourage its critical study, and to apply his thought as we examine humanity's place in the cosmos, as well as our responsibility for directing the development of an evolving world. I encourage you to become a member, and we have membership flyers over there on the table as you leave. Um, you can also find information on our website. So this evening we will proceed in the following way. After I introduce our speaker, and after we listen to his lecture, we will open the floor to questions and comments. For those on Zoom, we suggest that during the lecture or whenever a question or comment arises that you t type it into the chat box. We'll try to present as many of your questions as possible, but um, in the time allotted, which is you know, usually short, and anyone here, you can just raise your hand manually, and we'll try to get around to you too. So this evening, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. John Haught, Distinguished Research Professor and Emeritus in the Department of Theology at Georgetown University. A systematic theologian with particular interest in the nexus of science, cosmology, evolution, and ecology, Haught is among the most creative and constructive theologians in the field of science and religion, providing a brilliant and exhilarating analysis of what faith means in an age of science. He takes a deep and serious look at the science of our time and articulates an evolution-friendly theology, one that reveals a universe of full of potential and promise. His deep concern for ecology, transhumanism, and the value of human life and the meaning of suffering and death, issues for our times, gives further depth and relevance to his analysis. It offers a way for believers to think about how religion relates to discoveries in modern science, and as a consequence, suggests the possibility of a robust and credible faith. The author of 21 books, more than 100 book chapters and articles, as well as hundreds of invited lectures and major academic presentations, Haught plums the profound depths of the universe and offers fresh insight into the biblical nature of hope. In order to clarify his position with those who differ from him, he has engaged in countless stirring debates with both the new atheists 
and the creationists. And in 2005, he even testified as an expert witness on behalf of the plaintiff at the intelligent design trial in Harrisburg. Despite his brilliance, John Hort is a humble man, one who has dedicated his life to an exceptionally clear articulation of a theology that not only satisfies the mind, but also touches the heart. And so Chestnut Hill College was so impressed with Jack that we've offered him a, an honorary degree. So he is one of our alums. <laughs> So Jack, we're so happy to have you here with us this evening, and all of us, I'm sure. Um, I, 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 and I'm sure those on Zoom too are anxious to hear what you have to share with us. And so we welcome you to Chestnut Hill College, your alma mater, and uh, look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Well, thank you once again, Kathy, for your more than generous introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to come here to Chestnut Hill College uh, once again. Some of my most enjoyable lectures have been here. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, meet old friends and a number of new friends as well. Uh, and so, it's a great honor uh, to be here. I've met Kathy back in 1996, and she has been one of my best friends and also supporters for all these years. So thank you very much, I'm very grateful. I'm going to begin with two quotations from our subject, Teilhard de Chardin. He says, even though I cannot accept the form in which certain beliefs are expressed. The church possesses and transmits from century to century a view of Christ and spiritual life whose definitive form she is unable at any given moment to express completely. And then he adds, when thousands of years have gone by and Christ's true countenance is a little more plainly seen perhaps in another form of theology, the Christians of those days will still, without any reservations, recite the Apostles' Creed. I quote this paragraph because sometimes people think that Teilhard is a renegade from Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism. And he took pains to tell people that he never had any great temptation to leave the Catholic Church, as some of his secular friends and even some of his religious friends advised him. And he said that if he did leave the Catholic Church, it would be by obeying principles and ethical norms that he had picked up only by being a member of the Catholic Church. So, I mention that because I'm going to talk about how he was also a revolutionary and how his revolution in religion, in Christianity, and the relationship of Christianity to science has been quite controversial. He says the crust of fixity, that's the term he used often, and inertia accumulated around the church through 2,000 years of earthly sovereignty is so thick and paralyzing. It's so thick and paralyzing. <laughs> I was wondering if that was a providential <laughs> intervention there. <laughs> that one almost catches oneself hoping for some shock that will put the spirit of Christ back in circulation among the newborn waves of the universe. And much of that shock he found in the scientific world in the discovery uh, of the universe being a scientific, being a story rather than just a state. And much of his thought is an attempt to bring out not only the scientific consequences of this 20th century discovery, but also the theological implications of it. 
For the benefit of those few, perhaps, who have never studied Hayard or do not know much about who he is, so just a brief sketch of who he was. He was a Jesuit priest, geologist, paleontologist, who got interested because of the evolutionary nature of the sciences he was studying in integrating evolutionary science with his Christian faith. And he started circulating among his friends essays in mimeograph form, usually, of his ideas that were just forming uh, in the early 20th century about how, to, how we might make this adjustment in our theology and how we might think in a new way, if you're religious, of science. His superiors, however, thought that he should get out of the controversial European theater where he was uh, situated at the time when he was a young priest, and they asked him to go to China uh, to join the paleontological sciences there. And he became one of the top scientific uh, thinkers in the uh, in East, uh, one of the top paleontologists and geologists of the Asian continent when he was still a young man. And his scientific papers were never controversial, and they were deeply respect, respected by his scientific peers. After the war, he came back to the United States and was given a job at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And while he was there, as well as while he was in China, he was writing religious essays and, and books that were giving, he wanted to publish to give people a sense of how they could integrate their Christian faith with the new evolutionary sciences. But his superiors were not ready for this. The Vatican was not ready for it. And so they forbade the publication, especially of his major work, The Phenomenon of Man, now translated as The Human Phenomenon. And it was only after he died that these books were given to hungry publishers by his uh, friends, his lay associates and, and uh, editors. And they rapidly became one of the most influential strains of religious thought in the 20th century. One of the things he did while he was a stretcher bearer in the First World War is to start developing what he called his cosmic vision in which he taught that we cannot really understand God or Christ adequately now unless we place them in the framework of our new understanding of the universe and evolution. Not everybody knows that while he was in the First World War at the Battle of Verdun, uh, he was on the opposite side of the side that Paul Tillich was a chaplain in. And they didn't meet or didn't know each other. But I mention this because I'm going to talk about it later on because it's useful and instructive, I think, to compare Teilhard's vision with that of Paul Tillich. So I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Anyway, he thought that the most important discovery of modern science is that the universe is a story. How did we discover that the universe is a story? It's a long story. In fact, it's a, it's a story, the story of how we discovered that the universe is a story is almost as interesting as the story itself. I can't go into the details of it. A good, a good account of it, though, is in a, a, book, a book called uh, uh, by Timothy Ferris, Coming of Age in the Milky Way. It's a, it's a really good read and a good analysis of how we discovered that the universe is a story. Uh, the most influential person in this discovery was Albert Einstein. Einstein's general theory of relativity lay the groundwork for the Big Bang theory of the universe. But Einstein himself never really thought that time is real. Einstein, even though, he, ironically, he discovered that we can't separate the natural world from time, never thought of time as passage. He thought that our impression that the universe or the time passes is purely psychological, and the time itself is just another geometric dimension of the cosmos that can be understood best by geometry and mathematics rather than by own, our own public or private psychological experience. It was George Lemaitre, a Roman Catholic priest, 
who had just graduated from MIT and who turned out to be one of the great mathematical physicists of the 20th century, was poring over Einstein's equations and came to the conclusion, or speculated at least, that the equations can be interpreted to mean that the universe began as what Lemaitre called a primeval atom. And this atom is still expanding into what we call the Big Bang universe. So it was not so much Einstein as Lemaitre, who's the father or ancestor of the so-called Big Bang theory of the universe. Einstein himself did not like the ideas that the universe is a story, passage, a passage through time uh, that has a, has a narrative quality to it. He thought the universe was eternal. He was influenced by the philosopher Benedict Spinoza, who was a pantheist, who identified nature with God. And since God is, has the attributes of eternity and necessity, then the universe must have the characteristics of eternity and necessity. So the whole idea of placing this universe in time uh, seemed uh, almost blasphemous to Einstein himself. But gradually he did uh, come around, but not before he went back to the drawing board and doctored his equations and put into them uh, what he called an anti-gravity factor that would keep the bodies that are spread out in the universe far apart so that you know, gravity would not, if gravity were really working over time, it would have brought the whole universe into a big clump by now. But it's not, the universe is spread out, galaxies and stars are widely distributed. Uh, so he, 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 called, he called his mathematical fudge the cosmological constant, uh, which is, he thought necessary to keep the bodies from uh, collecting into, into this gravitational mass. Uh, at the same time that Einstein was toying with this idea, which he later regretted, Edwin Hubble and his staff at the Mount Wilson Observatory in California were noticing that some bodies in outer space were shifting as their light came to the telescopes, and it shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. And that implied that these bodies were receding. And so the light waves were stretched out more than if they were stationary or coming, uh, uh, converging toward the observer. And this, this redshift phenomenon became this almost smoking gun evidence that the universe is still expanding and, and has always been expanding. So that if you look at this top panel here on this diagram, the bodies are distributed remotely, very far apart. Hubble did not know at the time that these bodies were galaxies. It was only in the 20th century that we really discovered that there are galaxies. You can see how much science has progressed uh, through tele telescopes and through astronomy and astrophysics over our century. It's been an enormously interesting and exciting period. So if these bodies are distributed that far apart, and if, as the telescopes indicated, the universe is still expanding, that would imply that if you go back in time, you'll find that the bodies were closer together. And if you go back even further, they were even closer together. And if you go all the way back, they're all compacted in this initial single pinpoint of matter, smaller than the nucleus of an atom, infinitely hot and infinitely dense, that took off in this expansion that we now call the, the Big Bang uh, universe, which is still going on. And since anything that comes into existence, it would seem, must be brought into existence by something that already exists, wouldn't the fact that the universe came into existence require that there be something already existing that brought it into existence? And this is where theological speculation, since Einstein has focused primarily on the beginning. What does the beginning of a universe imply theologically? Interestingly, uh, 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 Teilhard said that uh, it, beginnings are, are very hard to, to pinpoint. It's very hard to, to, to find out what exactly happened then. But what we can be sure of, and he rests his whole scientific view of the universe on this, is that the universe is still expanding, which means it's still coming into being. That the universe is, in some sense, 
unfinished and that therefore the universe has a future that we never even conceived of as long as we thought that matter was eternal and the cosmos has been here forever. So dramatic things happened in science then that stimulated Teilhard's religious interpretation of what's going on in science. So he focused on the question and found it much more interesting to ask, not so much how it began, but where is it going? And what implications should that have for us and for our lives, including what should we be doing <laughs> with our lives if the universe is still coming into being? Where is it going? And this understanding of a universe, an unfinished universe, he thought should become the setting, the primary setting for all future theology. Uh, I, I have to confess that it hasn't yet happened, but it should happen and it could happen. Uh, there's been a problem not only with religious education, but with science education. Uh, in our times that prevents this from happening, including in our seminaries. How many seminaries teach cosmology? Uh, Teilhard would want all of them to start with this. This is the framework within which all religious thought, not just Christian, but all religious, religious thought should be set. This should be the form of theology. Uh, there are other forms that are still around and have been in, in use for centuries, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this, this cosmology, uh, he thought, should be the main form, the main backdrop of all of our thinking theologically. So that's why years ago when I first started teaching a course on science and religion at Georgetown, I wanted my students to get a sense of the scale of this story. Ever since Einstein, science, astrophysics, astronomy have now assumed correctly that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. And I wanted my students to, to get a sense of how long and how deep this story is. So I started thinking about it in terms of volumes uh, so imagine, I asked them, uh, imagine you have 30 big books on your shelf, and each of these books is 450 pages long, and each page stands for one million years in this story. The Big Bang would take place on page one of volume one, and the first two volumes, and part of the third, consist of what seems to be essentially lifeless and mindless, dead, inert, material stuff and lifeless and mindless processes or events. The earth spins out around the sun four and a half billion years ago along with the other planets, but life doesn't come in until toward the end of volume 22 of 3.8 billion years ago. And life doesn't become very complex until you get almost to the end of volume 29 where the famous Cambrian explosion uh, took place, and all of a sudden life began to, began to at an accelerating uh, pace, become more and more complex. But even so, dinosaurs don't come in until after the middle of volume 30. They go extinct on page 386, leaving only the last 64 pages of the last volume for the development of mammals, primates, and eventually humans, with the capacity to think, to experience, think, judge, and decide. This species that's able to do that came in only toward the bottom of page 450 of volume 30. Life then seems to many cosmologists to have been extremely accidental, to have come in as a kind of fluke. And mind or thought, as Teilhard called it, seems to be only an afterthought, a cosmic afterthought that comes into the, onto the scene only uh, maybe a fifth or a tenth from the bottom of page 450 of volume 30. So thought has arrived only recently. 
thought that emerald of evolution, the most wonderful and beautiful thing that the universe has come up with, has concocted, is very, very recent. And it seems to many scientists and most philosophers to be com uh, completely unintended. And even to the point where most philosophers today still think that mind or thought is not really part of nature. And scientific thought has tried to understand the universe as much as possible without taking a subjectivity or mind or thought as part of the fabric of the universe. It raises the question then, does the story uh, have a meaning? And what Teilhard came to, to, to believe was at the very least, it raises the question of meaning because the story has been of one, one of awakening, matter awakened to life and life to thought. And for Teilhard, these are not incidentals. These are events that were already anticipated on page one of volume one. So thought, uh, in his way of looking at things, has been an essential part of nature from the beginning, if you understand nature as a story and how the story as it goes along causes you to anticipate what's gonna happen uh, in the future. And that became uh, the main question, both scientifically and theologically uh, for Teilhard. So the question has become, for all of us, how should we read this story. Now that we know that the cosmos is a story, it invites us to read it. And like any other story, perhaps it has different levels of meaning and makes us wonder whether these levels of meaning, one of which is science, the other is theology and philosophy and other disciplines, uh, can be thought of as compatible or as mutually enriching one another. I think um, having looked at this question for many, many years, that there are really ma mainly three ways of reading this story. The first one I call archaeonomic, the second analogical, and the third anticipatory. And each of these ways of reading the universe has an ancient pedigree the archaeonomic approach goes back to Democritus, who was an atomist, who said that the best way to understand the universe, to understand anything, is that all of it is really nothing but atoms in the void. Atoms moving around haphazardly, gathering together, then crumbling apart throughout all the years, or throughout, throughout time. That's really all that's going on in the cosmos. And that's such an elegant and easy way to understand it that many scientific thinkers, and I think most philosophers today, still look upon that as the steadiest and most realistic way of reading the story. And it has had a tremendous influence on human culture. The analogical approach was prefigured by the philosopher Plato who thought that the best way to understand the universe is to see everything in it as a reflection, an analogy, or an imperfect copy of what is going on in the mind of God or in some platonic heaven uh, in an eternal, timeless sphere. And that the objective of life should be for us to detach ourselves from time and associate and cozy up more and more with eternity. Because time is cruel. Time leads to destruction and perishing. So why shouldn't we find some way to get out of time? And the Platonic way was a very efficient and intelligible way that still dominates the thinking of many people, including Christians and other people in the religious world today. The third approach, the anticipatory approach, however, is anticipated, I think, by the, by the figure uh, Abraham. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Stories about Abraham gave the Hebrews and eventually Christians and all the rest of us, at least unconsciously, a sense 
that there is a future, that there is promise, and that there is reason for hope. And this will be the approach that Teilhard will take. Let me say a little bit more about each of these before we go on. I had to invent a new word to describe the approach of Democritus, which was to reduce everything to elemental particles. Because now that we know that the universe is a 13.8 billion year old story, breaking things down in the present into their smallest particles is the same as going back in time to the very first moments of this cosmic story. So that it digs back into the past without knowing it. It thinks it's doing something presently intelligible. But what the analytical, materialist, atomist approach of philosophers and scientists today is really doing is taking us back in time to the primordial, pure moment of the universe being nothing but particulate subatomic entities. Uh, and to get there, we, we adopt the scientific practice of analysis. This is what analysis does. It breaks things down. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what science does. And it's an excellent tool for understanding. But archaeonomy, which comes from two Greek words, arche, which means beginning, and nomos, which means law, maintains that the basic law or structure or form of the universe was already composed 13.8 billion years ago. In the laws of physics, which have been, in Einstein's thought, eternal and unchanging, inviolable, and the entities, the elements that these laws have ordered and structured into different kinds of being over the years. <laughs> It's an intellectually attractive approach because it allows us to mathematize, to, to quantify what's going on in nature. It prescinds from anything subjective, from feeling, and reduces everything to unfeeling entities, particles, or cosmic stuff that's mindless and lifeless. And that means that life and mind are nothing but atoms either in this archaeonomic way of thinking. It's very popular. This is, a, this, this is still the default position in the intellectual world. If you want a good proof of that, look at how Th Thomas Nagel's book, Mind and Cosmos, was pilloried by the intellectual community several years ago when it first came out. Nagel, who had previously identified himself as a materialist, uh, writes in this book, Mind and Nature, that the Darwinian evolutionary materialism that most scientists use to understand the universe is wrong. It's just dead wrong, he said. And in saying this, uh, he encountered great animosity. Um, Michael Ruth says it was like a zebra, like a, like a zebra bit bursting into the horse pen. Uh, and I think that's not an exaggeration. And, and so this great scientist, or philosopher, highly esteemed philosopher, Thomas Nagel, was scoffed and scorned uh, by proposing that this archaeonomic approach is wrong, dead wrong. And later on, I'm going to show how Teilhard's thought uh, proves that even more soundly than uh, Nagel did in his book, Mind and Nature. So that's one approach. And implicitly, it endorses what I call a metaphysics of the past. A metaphysics means your view of what is really real, among other things. So what is really real for the archaeonomic thinker is the dead cosmic past, elemental, scattered monads and atoms and subatomic entities that existed at the very earliest phase of cosmic history. And it's all reducible to that. That's the really real world, uh, the one back there. The analogical approach, which goes back to Plato, and especially to Christian theologians and philosophers like St. Augustine, who used Plato's thought as the intellectual framework for their understanding of, Christ of Christian faith, maintains that what nature is, what this cosmic story is, 
and, and if you want to take that as your framework, is just a long display of things, objects, and persons, and souls, and feelings that point to some other world beyond nature. And the best way to adjust to reality is to accept that everything in nature is finite and limited in time, but at the same time, everything has the quality of pointing to or revealing the beauty of an eternal present into, from which everything has come, which, which everything reflects in some way or participates in, and that's how you make the world intelligible to you. You don't need science necessarily. The most intelligible way to make sense of, of things in the world is to see them as analogies of a perfect reality that exists in a timeless sphere of existence. So the spiritual life should consist, therefore, of finding ways to detach ourselves from time where imperfect things exist and find our way through contemplation, uh, through prayer, and eventually through death into this timeless world which we all long for in the depths of our heart. When Augustine says that we long, that our hearts long for God and they're restless until they rest in God, this is the kind of framework within which, this is a form, as Taylor would call it, in which so much traditional, uh, classical, especially Catholic uh, thought, uh, which is still present and dominates even in seminaries and, and other uh, places in the Christian world, uh, has found its home. Seek detachment from time. This approach implicitly uh, possesses what you might call a metaphysics of the eternal present. The really real is not things in time, but things in this timeless world. And if you want to get to the really real world, you have to live a life uh, so that when you die, you will be ready, your soul will be ready to migrate into this uh, eternal present. A very beautiful vision, uh, one that has uh, nurtured the souls of everybody in the Christian world for centuries, including Teilhard, including myself, and many of you too, um, but which Teilhard is wondering has perhaps become an obsolete form for religious thought. He's not harsh on his fellow Christians who, who love this approach. He called it a fixist approach because it fixes our destiny in some timeless world where change is impossible. But he's wondering, and this is why he was so controversial, why we have to stick to that form, which he says has encrusted theology for so many centuries, when another one is now available. And I think I would call it, this is not his word, but mine, I call his vision the anticipatory reading of the cosmic story. The cosmic story is still going on. And since it's still going on, we don't yet know how it's going to turn out. Uh, the universe is unfinished. And its meaning, if it has one, its narrat is narrative rather than just geometric. What he's looking for in all of his thought, I believe, is what I like to call narrative coherence. And it's so different from the way in which science, including his science works, which, for example, in the field of physics, looks for geometric coherence. Ever since Galileo on up through Einstein, it's geometry, which has been the royal road to truth and understanding. Uh, and when the Matrix came out with the idea that the universe is a story, it's no wonder that not just religious people, but scientists too, had difficulty embracing that because for them, the real world is the one that science and mathematics can give us. 
Whereas for Teilhard, to get to reality, you have to learn to wait in the same way you do when you read a story or a novel or attend a film or a play. You don't walk out of the theater after act one and say, I understand that. You have to stay there and watch the whole thing. You don't stop reading the Brothers Karamazov after chapter 15 when it's still not making any sense to you. You have to be patient. You have to wait. Everything good has required that we wait for it. And uh, this would be true, should it not, of the cosmos itself. The intelligibility of the cosmos is something for which we wait in anticipation. Whereas the analogical view is we get to the end or the fullness of meaning and being by participation. Participation, that's the Platonic word for intelligib finding intelligibility. Intelligibility is found by participating in the eternal. Whereas for Teilhard, intelligibility requires hope, requires the willingness to wait in expectation of something really big coming from up ahead. So we can't yet expect to make full sense of the universe. We need to wait for narrative coherence. And the name I give, this is, this is not Teilhard's name, but uh, somewhat controversially, I've given the name <clears throat> metaphysics of the future to this anticipatory view. At one point in Teilhard's writings, after he struggled all of his life to find what he calls solidity, something that's really unquestionable, something that can, can be the truth in which you can plant your soul. For him, as he says one time, the, the, the universe leans or rests on the future or is cantilevered on the future as its sole support. This is kind of new, except it's something like the Abrahamic understanding of time and reality, where in the stories about Abraham, God comes out of the future, not out of the eternal present, but out of the future, and invites Abraham to leave his home and his ancestors and take his family and move into a new future. And this became the fundamental motif of biblical thought. It's still there in St. Paul. When St. Paul tries to justify his own conversion, he says, I'm just following what Abraham did, trusting in the future. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, one of the impediments to that way of looking at things in religious thought has been the almost unmovable form of analogy, uh, so that what we have in Teilhard's thought in the context of other believers and theologians is a kind of conflict between the analogical and the anticipatory approach. Now, to summarize, the archaeonomic approach sees the story, the cosmic story, but no meaning in it. The story is just a sequence of events, deterministically and by chance, changing over the course of time. And time is merely a disturbance of the original simplicity, which we should get back to, according to uh, many scientific thinkers today. Get back to that original simplicity. Peter Atkins, a British physicist in one of his books wrote that all this complexity and variety that we see around us is nothing but primordial elemental simplicity masquerading as complexity. So to understand complexity, you have to see it as a mask cloaking and keeping your mind from getting back to the real world, which is that of original atomic multiplicity and dispersal. The analogical approach sees meaning in nature. It sees everything in nature, including everything in the cosmic story, as a 
a, a, almost a dis display, an extravagant display of sacraments or symbols that should point our minds and our hearts and our spirits toward the eternal present. So that's, nature is meaningful, but the analogical approach, which characterizes most Christian thought even today, completely ignores the cosmic story as inconsequential. So that when people of that way of thinking have read Teilhard, they have not seen what he's pointing to. He's pointing to a whole new form for theology to get away from just the analogical idea which keeps you ensconced in the present or the eternal present and turns your eyes away from what's coming from up ahead. Whereas the Abrahamic approach is open to what's coming. Uh, read the Bible sometime with just that simple motif in mind and see how it works its way from Genesis on up to Revelation. The analogical approach believes that God is timeless and the function of God is to deliver our souls and minds from time, from their being overwhelmed by the cruelty and uh, sometimes ugliness of temporal existence. Whereas the anticipatory approach sees deep time and waits for the meaning is willing to wait patiently and in hope. It hopes for what has already started to take place in the story, awakening. It hopes for this awakening that was exemplified in the origin of life and mind to have even more of a future in the in up ahead. So the question that I would raise then is what form, and I think this is what Teilhard is, raising, what form should faith have if it's not analogical, if we abandon the materialist way of looking at things, what's the best form for faith in the future? Uh, and what I've tried to do in uh, my book, Resting on the Future, is to kind of give a sample of how almost all the main beliefs we have in the creed and Christianity can be transfigured from an analogical to an anticipatory uh, way of uh, understanding. So Teilhard, I think, if, if I were to locate him in the context of other ways of looking at the world, would be the chief representative of this anticipatory approach. And to accept that, you have to believe that the universe is not just spinning its wheels, the universe is not just particles, exchanging uh, structures from time to time, but the universe is, is still becoming more. It's becoming more being, fuller in being, and newer in being as you look into the future. And so Teilhard would say that the first two readings actually clip the wings of hope. Uh, this, is, this is how he would criticize the form of theology that he grew up with and that he's trying somehow to find an alternative to. Now, before I go any further, uh, I have to point out, you've already probably seen this, that these three approaches never exist in complete, pure isolation from one another. And that in the real world, uh, most of us have a hybrid version of these. I think, for example, many Christians, especially those who have read the Bible and not just studied their catechism, would probably have a hybrid version of the analogical and the anticipatory. But I think it's good logically to distinguish these because logically they're not necessarily compatible. Let's go back to the archaeonomic approach. What's wrong with the archaeonomic approach? Especially since uh, in, the in the universities and academic world, uh, in journalistic scientific world, and in science in general, the archaeonomic reading is the default position of most thinkers. Read, this, read the New York Times science section. Read the New Yorker. Read all the popular journals like the Atlantic. And they mostly don't accept articles except those that manifest and cling to this archaeonomic approach. So what's wrong with it? It's spiritually deadening, for one thing, because it reduces the universe and life 
and mine to an original lifelessness and valuelessness. Uh, many intellectuals, though, are, are quite willing to accept that it's spiritually uh, dead or innocuous. But what Teilhard points out, and not too many people see this, is that archaeonomy is also intellectually and logically incoherent. Because look what it does. Archaeonomy takes any present example of complexity, say in a living organism, and subjects it to analysis, reducing it to lower and more uh, irreducible particles and entities as you go back in time. So it takes everything back to the past, where the past is, in the beginning, nothing but dispersed subatomic particles. Is that the road to intelligibility? No, that's the road not, that's the road not to coherence, but to incoherence. Because if you break down analytically an organism into its component cells and then break the cells down into large molecules and the large molecules into simpler ones and into atoms, and then as physics has done recently, break the atoms down into more and more simple elemental entities going all the way back, and we're still on that road to tracing the God particle, as somebody has called it. When I, when I look at this way of looking at things, I can't help but recall a, a doggerel from Jonathan Swift, that, uh, which he says, so natural is to observe, a flea hath smaller fleas that on him prey, and these have smaller fleas to bite him, and so proceed ad infinitum. So the archaeonomic approach is looking for the ultimately scattered particulate elemental phase of cosmic existence. Then it adds in inviolable laws of physics, and that's enough to understand everything that ever can happen or will happen. But it has arrived at what Teilhard calls decoherence, another word for which is unintelligibility. To make things intelligible, you have to unify them into some overall scheme that locates each entity within that scheme. So for Teilhard to understand the universe, to find coherence or intelligibility, after you've gone back in time to that mass of original particles, turn around 180 degrees and look forward to the future. And then you will see these particles coming together over time in more and more interesting and complex configurations. And so far it has produced living tissue and, and brains that are capable of thought. Is that the end of it? Or should we not look forward to a further awakening of the universe. That's where we'll find intelligibility, not in the past, but in the future. Only by looking toward the not yet can we begin to make sense of the cosmic story. And for that, you need patience. What about the analogical form of theology, which pictured the universe as a ladder of static levels, matter, plant, animals, humans, angels, perhaps, and God. This scheme operates according to what you might call the principle of plenitude, that everything that was ever intended to exist will find a place in this static, vertical, hierarchical scheme or great chain of being, as some call it, and where each chain reflects or participates in eternity in its own way. And that's what gives meaning to this analogical world. Um, the problem with it, uh, if you follow Teilhard, uh, and, and these are not his exact words, but this is my understanding, is that the analogical form that's 
fundamental form of our religious and theological life now uh, since antiquity doesn't or even can't really appreciate the passage of time and how the passage of time and especially deep time, billions and billions of years, can give to cosmic outcomes a precious value that they would not have if they were magically and inst instantaneously brought into existence. Science is so lovely because it avoids magic. Good science does not allow for anything to come into being just out of the blue. Uh, but even science don't appreciate how when they look at life and mind, they're not just particles of lifeless and mindless stuff. They are products of a long, long storied history that gives meaning to them, value to them, that they would not have if they were instantaneously brought into existence. So instead of being a scandal to religious people that we've discovered that time is deep, theology should now make deep time its framework for thinking about the value of things. Furthermore, the analogical way of looking at things fails because of its hierarchical ladders, which seem to have lines of discontinuity between the levels, between and among the levels. The analogical approach thereby fails to acknowledge the gradualism in natural history. So that what we have to do theologically and ethically is somehow learn to realize, learn to think of what is good and what is real without blurring those lines, without thinking that somehow there are jumps in nature. Nature, natura non fecit saltum. Nature does not make leaps like that. Nature is a gradual process. And what happened early in the universe is precious as we look at life and consciousness here and now. So the whole cosmos becomes replete with a meaning and a value that it didn't have when we had a, only a static, a hierarchical a way of looking at things. And furthermore, I think all of us can uh, realize this, the analogical approach in religion and theology has little interest, sometimes almost no interest in the cosmic future. It's interested in allowing souls to awaken to the eternal present. But theology today, uh, as in the past, is still not terribly concerned about the fact that the universe is still coming into being and that the universe still has a future, which it's very difficult for us to put our uh, hands on, a future which is not yet but which requires a faith that is willing to wait. Hope that is seen, St. Paul says, is not hope. Faith that is seen is not faith. So there has to be a story, uh, sometimes a long story, if things are to be valued. And that's especially true of th all things in nature. The analogical approach gives us what I like to call a halfway hope. It gives us hope for the survival of our souls in a timeless world apart from this one. But the problem with that intellectually is that after these souls have departed and gone to eternity, the cosmos is left soulless, mindless, and lifeless. And that is the modern view of nature that happened after Galileo and after, especially after Descartes, who separated mind from nature, therefore logically making nature fundamentally mindless, lifeless, and soulless. Ironically, this lifeless, mindless, and soulless residue that is left after the soul has departed has become the foundation of reality 
or the archaeonomic way of looking at things. So religions and philosophies bear a lot of blame for making the archaeonomic view possible in the first place. Materialism, which is a view that matters, all there is, was first made possible <coughs> logically <coughs> when Descartes said, let's put mind on one side of the divide and matter on the other. And that means that since mind is over here and mind is not over here, matter is mindless. But that, beca that became ultimate reality for the archaeonomic approach. And it could only be healed by a sense that time is real and that time is important. Time is not just a holding place for souls before they enter into eternity. Time is of utmost importance. And Teilhard justifies this theologically simply because his God, the God who becomes incarnate in matter, who becomes incarnate in Christ, loves the material, the material world. So why shouldn't we? This is Teilhard's theology. I don't want to go into this, but I've read articles and books even maintaining that this static, vertical, hierarchical approach has been a convenient platform for clericalism and its way of organizing and structuring uh, human existence, something that uh, Pope Francis has identified as maybe the biggest problem uh, in the Catholic Church today. Fundamentally, the analogical approach ignores faith's need for patience. There's really no faith unless there's a patience that forms the substance of it. It's shallow, it's superficial, if it's not accompanied by patience. And many forms of religion are not willing to wait. Nor is archaeonomy. Both archaeonomy and analogy suffer from the same impatience uh, that it refuses to wait for great things to happen. And also, it goes without saying, the analogical approach allows no room for more being or fuller being in the world because it's placed ultimate being in a timeless sphere outside of time. And important today, and you could spend lots of time talking about this, the negative ecological implications of the analogical approach, especially in its dualistic versions, are unspeakable in a way because what, what this way of this form of faith is saying is that since we're going to depart from this world anyway, why should we bother to take care of it? And I'm wondering if the only way we can give a religious or theological justification to ecological responsibility and morality is to consider the anticipatory approach uh, to interpreting the natural world. Uh, if you'll bear with me for a moment, uh, before I, I have time to go into the anticipatory understanding, I want to compare Teilhard's thought to another theologian who has an alternative form of analogical faith and theology. His name was Paul Tillich. And Paul Tillich, while he was uh, in the war, First World War, uh, later he testified that the experience of war really transformed his theology. Uh, Tillich uh, suffered several, or two, at least two breakdowns while he was a, a Protestant chaplain in the war. While Teilhard was bearing stretchers and writing essays on longing or nostalgia for the front. It's really interesting, interesting to compare the two ways of trying to make something of their experience of war. But first, Tillich. Tillich says what the war taught him more than anything else was that beneath the surface of our lives, there's a dimension of depth, an inexhaustible dimension of depth. And we can see this depth in other persons, in ourselves, and we experience it in social existence, and also in our relationship to nature. We experience this depth dimension if we only care to examine our own attitude toward nature, toward other persons, ourselves and others. 
Other persons, for example, we get to know them on a certain level for a while, and we think we know them, we think we've plumbed rock bottom, and yet there is still more to them. So to continue a relationship, we have to pierce a deeper level of that person's being. And this happens again and again. And eventually we realize that we have to do this because each person has an inexhaustible dimension of depth. People are not surface only. They are bearers afloat, you might say, on this sea, this infinite sea of depth. And this depth confronts us first as an abyss, which causes us to recoil from it, but once we realize we can't back off and are rocked into the abyss, we find that it turns out to be ground and satisfying. And the true happiness and salvation and redemption can be found only in the ground of our existence. We also have a depth in ourselves. When we're young, we form a, an image of ourselves that's usually the reflection back to us of opinions of others. And then we have our own experiences, our own desires, and we have to pierce a deeper level of our own being to understand who we are. We have to detach, detach ourselves from the estimation or opinion of others to some degree to understand ourselves. And this can go on and on during life because each of us has an inexhaustible depth. And in Tillich's time, this was the significance of depth psychology, which made it so interesting to people, is that Freud and Jung, in their own way, in their own inadequate way, also agreed that there's always something more beneath the surface of our lives and our sense of ourselves. And, but for Tillich, this something beneath the depth is not just a collective unconscious, as Jung would call it, or Freud's personal unconscious. It's an inexhaustible, unfathomable dimension of depth, which confronts us as an abyss, which we shrink back from, but once we're rocked into that depth, we experience it as ground. Also, very quickly, in our social existence, we tend to cling to the surface more than in any other area of our experience. And when cracks appear in the surface of our lives together, what we do is typically resort to patchwork. Think of the ecological predicament that the planet is facing right now and how most of the response to it has not been to deepen our understanding of nature, but to resort to patchwork of various types. But eventually, patchwork gives way to earthquakes. Tillich has a lot of very earthy metaphors in his analogical understanding of religion and faith. And these earthquakes with inevitably force us into the depths, which confronts us again as an abyss, which we shrink back from, but once, once we realize we can't escape it, we find ourselves on more solid ground than before. And then in the ground lies depth and, and joy, uh, according to Tillich. And then finally, the natural world itself, to come back to the issue of science and religion. The natural world itself has an infinite and inexhaustible depth. Science, the history of science, is proof of that. For centuries, we thought that Ptolemy, for example, had reached rock bottom in our understanding of the stars and planets and of the universe in general. But then Galileo and Newton, and before them, Copernicus came along and invited us to face an abyss that we hadn't faced before. So earthquakes take place in science. Nowhere more, nowhere more than in the coming of Darwinian evolutionary biology. That has shaken the faith, has shaken the surface of the faith of so many people. And what have they done? Most of Christians, instead of embracing the depth that Darwin exposed, have resorted to the surface of design arguments, of pa uh, pallid providential ideas of a designing deity, uh, and uh, have, have opposed uh, Darwinian ideas. Uh, whereas Teilhard was one of the first, and he's the one who inspired me most to, to dig into evolution. Teilhard realized that evolution is inviting us deeper and deeper. He eventually said that 
the only way to make sense, <clears throat> sense of faith and theology is, is to see it in an evolutionary uh, context. Einstein, too, uh, rocked the surface of our understanding of nature. Even he was unwilling to face the temporal abyss that his ideas were opening up and that the matrix was making public. Einstein went back to the idea of the eternal present as the framework for his thinking. So it's not just religious people, it's scientific thinkers too who find it difficult to face the abyss of nature. But there is an inexhaustible depth of nature which makes the history of science possible and which actually gives science a future. It's an abyss, but it's also ground. So there's not gonna be any near ending to scientific exploration as long as there's this infinite, inexhaustible depth beneath the surface. So what does faith mean and what do the words God mean in a Tillichian context? The name of this infinite and inexhaustible depth is God. That depth is what the word God means. And if that word has not much meaning for you, translate it and speak of the depths of your life. Perhaps in order to do this, you must forget everything traditional that you've learned about God, perhaps even that word itself. And Tillich, or Teilhard would say that Tillich's version of the analogical form is interesting, and in, in many ways it's an improvement, but it still leaves something out. It leaves out the dimension of futurity. It ignores the fact that the universe is becoming more and is becoming new. So Teilhard's anticipatory form of faith, to summarize, uh, would argue that faith looks for God coming from up ahead. God comes in the arrival of future. It's not the depth that grasp, grasps us so much as it's the future that is grasping hold of us. And we resist that almost as much as we, we resist the depth beneath the surface. So look for God, uh, Teilhard would say, and for freedom and redemption, not in gaps of the past, as science is looking for, nor in interruptions, magical interruptions of nature, nor outside of time. Look for God where the universe is still awakening to a new future, to what is not yet. And I'll have to stop there, and the rest of my talk is not yet. <laughs> So thank you so so very very much, uh, Jack. That was that was really wonderful, and uh, such a creative way of looking at um, you know Teilhard's work. That's what I love. You know, getting getting uh, the the idea, but then putting it into um, a framework that really helps us to see into the future. So we do have time for some questions. Um, I will watch the um, the questions on the uh, chat and. Uh, Dr. Andrew Delossi will uh, field, field the questions. Okay, so we'll start with questions in the room and then we will oscillate back to the chat when available. So we have a question right over here. Thank you. One of the, oh, thank you. One of the simplicities of uh, first grade in the Baltimore Catechism was that God created the heavens and the earth. And based on what I heard tonight from you, that, that it's a story and that it's still coming into being, is it reasonable to say that God is still creating the heavens and the earth? Oh, yes, and Tara would love that question, and I, I like it too, because yes, it's just that our theology of creation needs a new form as well as our theology in general. And that uh, what we need to, to bring into our theology of creation in its new form, in its anticipatory form, is that God creates from out of the future that it, we don't want to locate God simply as the initial push that sparked the Big Bang, but to think of God's creativity as an invitation for something other than God's self to awaken to truth 
meaning, goodness. But all of these attributes that we used to call transcendentals, being, truth, goodness, beauty, and unity, now need to be coated over with the theme of futurity. When he says the world rests on the future as its sole support, he's inviting us to think of God as the future calling creation into being, not forcing it, but letting it be. So uh, since God does not act as a magician uh, in Teilhard's thought, that allows us to think of the creation of the universe as a long story of becoming more, becoming fuller, and becoming new. And in that same line, Teilhard wants us to reconfigure Christology, our, our theology of Christ. Uh, what Christ is, in terms of an anticipatory universe, is the universe itself coming to a head where it's awakening fully to this call to become more, to become more real, more being, fuller, and uh, sacred. Uh, what we're uh, uh, looking for is a God who invites Christ to this stance of a full awakening. At the same time in Christ, our theology rightly says that this awakener becomes fully present in the cosmos. So the future is not something out there. The future is something that affects every present moment, inviting it to become new. Uh, so we, uh, creativity can be thought of, in summary, as something that takes place out of the future rather than just out of the past or out of the eternal now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hod, uh, Dr. James O'Sullivan uh, from University St. Joseph's University. Um, first of all, as we discussed uh, briefly at dinner, thank you for all of the work that you've done, uh, deep admirer. I am rather shocked, however, in the fact that what you just presented sounds wildly teleological to me, and yet you did not mention either Aristotle or Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. And I'm shocked for many reasons because I think that that goes to the heart of very much where the divides occur and the way that the divides are still existent. Yeah. And a second part of that is you mention that God is waiting, and I agree. I, again, I think it's an elegant exposition. But as we discussed, why not then is it pure process theology? God why is not, why not make pure process theology, Whiteheadian, right? So it is God is allowing things to purely process themselves, but that's not the God as God reveals God's self in the memory of the history of the people of Israel and then definitively in Jesus of Nazareth according to the yeah. Christian tradition, right? Yeah. So I am curious, when Teilhard insists upon, yes, the alpha and then the omega point, is not the omega point been happening? And is it not still happening? So in other words, it's not purely anticipatory, I don't think. I don't think that's Christian to say. Yeah. Tell me why or why I'm not wrong on that. Well, Teilhard agrees that God is both alpha and omega, but then he says that God is more omega than alpha. Uh, that sort of summarizes his, his slant on things. And as for Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas, uh, I'm, I, I have talked about them in my studies of the analogical vision as different forms of the analogical vision. I, in, in a talk like this, you have to be very generalized. And, and uh, I, uh, Alfred North Whitehead used to say, in your, in your talks and teaching, seek simplicity, uh, but then mistrust it. Uh, and I, I try to follow that, and I, uh, that's why I entertain and, and appreciate your questions, because they, they obviously point out places where I need to develop uh, my understanding of the analogical vision. And Aristotle is extremely important for the great chain of being idea, which Thomas Aquinas accepted, <clears throat> and which most theologians have accepted, which I accepted 
when I first studied theology, I was tranced, I was intrigued, I was infatuated by this analogical vision. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. And it delivered me from uh, a lot of uh, misery that I would have had if I didn't have this to fall back on. All Taylor wants to do is just transform, not, not reject the analogical vision, but transform it into an, to give it another dimension, a dimension of futurity, which it has lacked and which the Bible has, but we have not appropriated sufficiently. So we have a question from uh, George Comedes, Cosmides. Um, he wants to know, is anyone working on this newer approach to theology? Is there an updated theology? And I think you've presented one, but are there others? Maybe that's a better yeah. way. Um, I, I don't know uh, of too many. I think it's implicit in the work of a lot of uh, people who've studied Teilhard. Uh, what I'm doing, and, and what most Teilhardians do not do, is to draw a stark contrast between aspects of his thought and others. But to say that there's a contrast does not mean that there's a departure uh, altogether. It doesn't mean jettisoning tradition. Uh, I'm, I'm still uh, delighted to read Augustine and uh, the, the fathers of the church, the early writers of the church, and I love Thomas Aquinas. I cut my philosophical teeth on Thomas Aquinas and found it the, the, the most exciting thing I had ever seen in my life. Uh, so I, I'm not in any way uh, looking at Teilhard as though he's disparaging the, the tradition that he grew out of. He's, he's saying that because of the nature of reality as unfinished, there is room for change. There's room for more being, for more fullness of faith. So he wants a faith that's fuller than the ones that he inherited in his theological training. He wants to show how uh, faith is how not just I am grasped by ultimate reality, but how the universe is, has been grasped by God, the God of the future, from the very beginning. And uh, I've pointed out in other contexts how contemporary physics and astrophysics have shown uh, it's quite plausible for us to, to notice now that the physics of the early universe, such as the ratio of electron to proton mass, the ratio of the weak to strong nuclear forces, and especially the expansion rate of the universe, and the force of the gravitational coupling constant, which were set in the, in the first moment of the Big Bang universe, are such that if they had varied infinitesimally from the values that they have, there would never have been any life, any mind. It would have been a mindless and lifeless universe uh, throughout an inexhaustible and interminable uh, future. Uh, so uh, this anticipatory aspect that I'm emphasizing is not just a theological uh, wish or dream. It's something that helps us make the universe especially an unfinished universe, more intelligible, more coherent than does the dominantly archaeonomic way of looking at the natural world uh, in the, in the uh, journalistic and academic world today. The, for the cosmological constant, what you mentioned is 10 to the 120th power is the actual like if it were different by anything besides 10 to the 120th power, it's mm -hmm. astronomical. I only know that because of my studies. When you mention uh, thought evolving, um, something that I kind of question, and I'd love your input, what do you suppose, do, what do you suppose came first, emotion or thought? In other words, the development of relationship and close relationship between organisms themselves <laughs> or kind of an abstract thought and rationality of the universe? Uh, I would say, and I think Taylor looks at it this way too, that uh, the, since there are no sharp lines in this gradualistic evolution, there are no 
sharp lines of division, that uh, the universe, after it became alive, became sentient in a very low degree of sentience, but that as time developed, sentience intensified. It turned into uh, experience, and it eventually it, uh, it, it allowed for some kind of consciousness, rudimentary consciousness, in primates and perhaps other animals. So I don't want to locate consciousness only in us, but it's, it is in us in a rather remarkable intensity. So that if you have the idea that the universe is an anticipatory story, that you can see everything, including the, the phase of pure, mindless, material existence as somehow anticipating a future in which life would eventually spark into existence, awaken. I like the metaphor of an awakening universe. An awakening universe can be asleep for a while, but then as time goes on, it can awaken. It can start anticipating something from the future more and more intense, and more and more good, beautiful, and true. So when thought comes into the scene, when consciousness emerges, it's not as though it's broken from the past. It's not a sharp divide in cosmic history. It's an intensification of anticipation, which is there in life, in life striving to succeed. There's an anticipation. But when consciousness comes onto the scene more recently in the human form, this anticipation intensifies to the point where people anticipate, humans are, are, are beings that anticipate meaning. And they express this in their early myths and religions, which were expressions of the need for something, for a story, for a coherence, for a narrative coherence. And then as consciousness developed and as myth developed into uh, science and thought, the anticipatory intensity doesn't subside. It, it, it keeps growing. But it's been there all along in different degrees. So it's a matter of degree of awakening that uh, distinguishes consciousness from sentience, as you're talking about, or feeling. But feeling remains an aspect of consciousness very much. So, but uh, when human consciousness comes along, it experiences what Bernard Lonergan calls uh, transcendental imperatives. We experience something in our minds that says, be attentive, but that's not enough. Be not only attentive, be intelligent. Look for the intelligibility in things. And after it does that, uh, it says, okay, you think you understand, you've reached some intelligibility. Well, not every bright idea is a true idea. So seek true ideas, seek, seek right understanding. And the moment that imperative came into cosmic history, the cosmos was bent on goodness. Uh, on being, on beauty, in a way that it hadn't been before. But it's still continuous with the whole awakening of the universe. And the question arises then, uh, to what is the universe awakening? And it's that question uh, that we should locate theology, especially today, in relation to not not so much in relation to beginning, how did it begin, but to what is it awakening? This, and, and hasn't this awakening been creatively preparing the universe from the beginning for deeper and deeper awakening? And since the 30 volumes I showed are, uh, for, are perhaps in the final analysis only the dawn of this awakening, we have to make room for the possibility of other volumes uh, up ahead. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, we have to be ethically prepared to save the life systems of our planet Earth or elsewhere in the universe so that this future awakening can take place. So the great sin of ecological abuse from a Teilhardian point of view is that we cut off the anticipatory uh, elan of the universe and suppress it. Uh, that's that's the, the tragedy of ecological abuse. We have a question here from Donald Leonard, 
who says, what does the divinization and the spiritualization of matter mean in Teilhard's writing? Okay, Teilhard uses the word spirit a lot. We should not understand it uh, to, to be a dualistic uh, way of thinking about things, arranging things in terms of matter on the one side of the divide and spirit on the other. Uh, at one point in his writings, he says that <clears throat> matter <clears throat> is spirit in a state of multiplicity. He's talking about the early universe. Spirit was not absent in this particulate phase of the cosmos. And spirit is matter in the state of unity. Spirit is matter that has developed as a result of this anticipatory pull or lure has developed into a complexity that allows for the leap into consciousness and thought to take place. So spirit and matter are like two ends of, uh, are indivisible, they can't be separated, but they're like two ends of a process. It begins with multiplicity and it eventually brings about a unity which was not present in the beginning. And so the question is where does this, uni where does this unity come from? Uh, Democritus would have said, it's just atoms rearranging themselves in a very interesting way. Uh, but for Teilhard, <laughs> Complexity is a result of the fact that the universe has been awakening and is still awakening to something infinitely true, infinitely good, infinitely, be infinitely beautiful, uh, and, and infinitely loving. So the ultimate force of unification that has been anticipated by other physical and biological forms of unity, the, the ultimate form of unity or unification is, is that of love, the power of love to bring together otherness, to, to uh, uh, overcome the forces of hatred and disunity. <clears throat> so in that way, he makes room for everything uh, that's there in the creed. This is why he can still say the Apostles' Creed. Thank you, Dr. Haught, for taking the time to answer these very thoughtful questions. Thank you for uh, your second presentation in two nights here. So uh, on behalf of the American Tarot Association and Chestnut Hill College and Dalesford Abbey, we are just incredibly grateful for all of your wisdom that you've shared with us. Let's Thank give Dr. Haught a final hand. And we're gonna turn it over to Sister Kathy for some closing words here.